Welcome to Year 2, hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer, Frank Mace, and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet, Billy O'Connor. Today's guest, actor, head of the class, the Karate Kid, Cobra Kai, Tony O'Dell. Happy New Year, my brother. Happy New Year, my brother. How you doing? Great, great. Looking for the year ahead? Looking forward? Yeah. Well, got any resolutions? Tell me your resolutions. <laughs> I was thinking about earning a buck this year, Frank. Maybe I'll earn a buck. <laughs> be a good idea. I, I, you know, do you do you go out? You don't make a big deal of it anymore, do you? No, no. Do you make it to the when they drop the ball at least? And out here, it's easy. On the East Coast, <laughs> I, I make it to New York, East Coast, and you know, every day on first first of July, first of July, first of January, the the jet flies over the parade. And Pasadena, the Rose Parade. Oh, so that what's the big fighter plane that looks like a uh, monstrosity or something? Looks like a Derek. stealth. Not the stealth. stealth. The yeah. stealth bomber. Yeah, yeah. It flies overhead. Does it really? Yeah, it wakes me up. <laughs> wakes you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's easy to make the, the ball dropping out here at nine o'clock yeah. right, instead of midnight. Yeah, I, I used to be a, 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 an animal for all that stuff. Like you know, New Year's Eve. No a, kidding. Oh yeah, that was like <laughs> the original party animal used to be an animal at parties. <laughs> you remember? When you were a kid, you used to sneak out of your house to get to a party. Now you sneak out of the parties to get back to your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you just go home and lie down. After the ball drops on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, I, it's not a, I just can't stand crowds anymore. You know, Mardi Gras. Or, I, I never would. I don't think I, I've ever talked to a native New Yorker who's been down to watch the ball drop at Times Square. Oh, me either. I don't think I've ever talked to a who, who goes. Tell me your best New Year's Eve ever. My best New Year's Eve ever. Wow, that's scary. That's really, that's really hit me. Well, best New Year's Eve. Ever. Well, you know what? I I, I got to tell you, the last when I was out partying, when I was out, you know, going at it. Twenty five years of those New Years when I was partying hard, I owned a bar or a restaurant, so I could never get off New Year's Eve. So the big day for me was New Year's Day. And what happens is, in New York anyway, all the bar owners, the barmaids, the waitresses, New Year's Eve, they're all working. So New Year's Day, you know, and you get off at 4 o'clock in the morning, you go at 5 o'clock in the morning, you go to the after hours club, you start drinking there. And when you hit the bars in the Bronx and Manhattan on New Year's Day, it's all bar owners. It's all bar waitresses. It's all sort of everybody you know, you know, and they're all pros. There's no fights. You know, all the grief is... New yeah. Year's Eve, the amateurs. Yeah. When an amateur goes drinking, you know, he puts on a hat and he figures he's got to be the loudest guy in the place. The pros, you know, they just get drunk. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I used to love New Year's Day. That was my day. Not New Year's Eve so much. But my best New Year's Eve. Oh, I'll tell you a New Year's Eve story. Quick one. I was in New Orleans. And uh, my brother was, was, was going out with this girl who worked at the Monteleone Hotel. Right? She, she was a waitress at the Monteleone. And she said, Fat Stamino is coming to the Monteleone for New Year's Eve. You know, and I said, well, Fat Stamino, great. You know, we, but you got to be dressed. You got to rent the tux. You know, it's a big deal. We all rent the tuxes. And I think my brother even got his hair done. <laughs> when he got his hair blown out or whatever. And we're all going, I got a date. We're all going to the Monteleone. Great night. She set us up. We got great seats uh, for Fat Stamino at the Monteleone. And the guy says, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. For the wonderful, the fantastic, the unbelievable, the incomparable Fats Domino. And Fats came out and he was drunk out of his mind. <laughs> I mean, he sat at that stool, he played about four bars and fell off the stool. <laughs> and similar, similar to your story about Red Fox, the guy says, Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Fats Domino. <laughs> and boom, gone. They carried him off. And that was our big night for Fats Domino at the, at the Monteleone Hotel. Yeah, my favorite New Year's Eve was about, well, I have a couple of them in, in a row, two or, th two or three years in a row. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, my friend Eddie Herbert ran a restaurant. He was the owner. And Eddie was from New Orleans, and he was Jay Thomas's best friend. So I, I remember 20, 30 years ago because I think everybody in my life was still alive then. Yeah. So we were all together at Eddie's restaurant, and Eddie would close the place, and, and Jay and I would host a New Year's Eve party. And 
we would invite all of our friends. And this is after the place is closed. You guys would host. Oh, he would just close. Oh, yeah. he would just close for New Year's Eve. Right. He wouldn't be open. And he would close for New Year's Eve, and he would make red beans and rice, and he would oh, make no. Creole food, and he would. We would drink to our heart's content. And, you know, Jay and I would pick up the tab, but I remember all of our, you know, Howard Morris, Jay Thomas, oh. all of all of our my legendary figures were there at that. My parents were still here. Uh, they were out here in California. They were there. Uh, it was a, and that went on for two or three years. Two or three years yeah, in a row. Yeah, that's, that's great, great. Great New Year's. Well, you hung out with a much better class of drunk than I did, Frank. <laughs> Yeah. You handed out with you. I mean, even if they were drinking, well, they were some famous drunks. Yeah, but the famous drunks that you hung out with had many benefits as well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but they're all. I mean, so many. You know, anybody. If you're not an imposter, if you're a real drunk, it, it's very it takes up a lot of time. <laughs> if you're gonna do it right, you really don't have a lot of time for anything else. You know, if you're gonna be, a, you know, I mean. It got to the point when I was drinking that it would take me, I'd go out for two or three days and get drunk, and then it would take two or three days to recover. Wow. And the recoveries get longer. You know, the hangovers get worse, the recoveries get longer, and you stop or you die. It's that simple. How often did you get called out in fires on New Year's Eve? Oh, yeah. Well, New Year's Eve was- And, ca uh, and car wrecks. Car wrecks, you're right. A lot of car wrecks, a lot of fires. Winter in New York, if you're a fireman, is always busy, especially in the bad neighborhoods. Because you got all the space heaters, you know, you got mm -hmm. people, the landlords don't want to send up heat. Yeah. People resort to whatever they got to do, and it's always worse. But around the holidays, if you get a fire around Christmas time, you know, you get a couple of jobs at Christmas, New Year's Eve. It's so, what trend. did you guys do? Get alternate? Taking, you know what? taking Christmas off and taking New Year's Eve off? Yeah, so, what usually happens in a fire. You didn't work both, did you? No. The, rarely, rarely, rarely would I ever work both. But the, what happens is in a firehouse, when guys work like Christmas or New Year's, what they usually do is the younger guys, especially Christmas, the younger guys would step up and give the guys with family the day off. You know, like they would, they'd work mutuals and work that right. day. And in, in tradition in my house anyway was that uh, they'd have a huge meal. Like they'd, that would be, they'd have lobster and steak or whatever for lunch or dinner, you know, their big meal. And the guys that were not working would pay for the meal. And who would cook it? Well, one of the firemen. You know, yeah. All of one of the firemen would cook it. But they'd have like a, they'd go soup to nuts on those days, you know, because they were stepping up and working right. those holidays. Right. And uh, New Year's Eve, I mean, it was no problem. Guys, guys that were like, you know, real family men, they would love to work New Year's Eve because they come in New Year's Eve. First of all, they don't have to take their wife out New Year's Eve. That was number one. <laughs> they saved a few bucks. And then they tell their wife they were eating hot dogs at the firehouse. Meanwhile, they'd be having filet mignon or whatever. Like, and uh, So it was easy to get New Year's Eve off. And I had to have New Year's Eve off because I had the joints. You right. know, I, I owned the bar. And uh, New Year's Eve was a real amateur night. I hated New Year's Eve. Not for the money, though. No, the money was, he was good. selling a lot of Perrier on tap that night. <laughs> <laughs> Dom Perignon. Hey, how about some of this Dom Perignon? That's, yeah, yeah, that's I, hilarious. I used to, I used to. My my idea of New Year's Eve was I'd get a, an eight ball of cocaine. That was before I even got out of the house. I get an eight ball and two bottles of like Dom Perignon, two good bottles of champagne, and then that would be no matter where I ended up. I mean, I was going to finish it up with the Dom Perignon, but uh, New Year's Eve. Tough night. Christmas Eve. That's not a bar night. Yeah, well, we, we already went into that. We already ruined, we already ruined one show. <laughs> we ruined the, somebody's Christmas. We, no, we ruined a lot of people, our audiences, people, with your morose, <laughs> with your morose <laughs> dealing Humbug. of Christmas. So, um, are there no workhouses? Are, are you going to uh, sail off into the sunset this year? In what respect? I, you, on, your <laughs> sail, <laughs> on your sailboat. Are you telling me I, <laughs> on you your sailboat. to be here next year? <laughs> on your sailboat. I don't know. I hope, I hope to God I get a sailboat. I mean, I'm looking for one, but she's, you know, my wife's uh, uh, recuperating at the moment. And she recuperated better on, on the water, I'm sure. But uh, I got to wait. Wait it out a little bit. But I'm definitely going to get a sailboat. I got it. So this is the beginning of our third year calendar year we started this podcast in 2001 uh, and 2020 <coughs> we got 2020 and it's <coughs> 2022 now hard we to got, believe what, close to 80 episodes i think we do i think we do and this one we've got a great guest 
Mr. Tony O'Dell, who I've known for, for 35 years, back to the days he played Alan on Head of the Class. So why don't we bring him on, Derek? Derek? Can we bring him on? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tony, what? Tony, what? Bless oh, you. Sorry. Bless you. Bless your heart. What chapter are you on? Well, I've kind of read them all, but I particularly like the one about Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> <laughs> Don't what? tell any tales out of school. <laughs> Why don't you read us a passage? No, I'm only kidding. Oh, my God. Well, obviously, you got great literary taste anyway. That speaks volumes for you. Well, here's, this is Head of the Class Goes to Moscow, so that's a good one. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that for sure yeah. on this podcast. How you doing, pal? I'm doing great. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you, pal. Nice to meet you. Real pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. I feel like I know you because, you know, I do. I watch the show. I um, I actually just watched the episode with Constance Marie. So, Yeah, when I needed to get Constance Marie's phone number, I called Tony. I said, Tony, you got Constance Marie's phone number? <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting. Constance Marie has something in common. I mean, she played uh, J-Lo's mother and she was only three years older than her, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is your life story. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, uh, you're playing 16-year-old kids when you're 26 years old. Oh yeah, boy! I see you. You you know your stuff. I don't know about knowing my stuff, but I, I envy your position. I can't play. Uh, I can't play a seventy three year old man at seventy three. <laughs> <laughs> just well, I, about I think it is. It is pretty crazy that at thirty one, when we finished the show, I think at thirty one, I was playing seventeen or eighteen, and the only other person that was doing that was Dan Frischman, who uh, who played Arvid, who was only six months older than maybe three months older than me. Yeah. Ironically, the the youngest person in the cast graduated and went to college after three years. That was Tannis Valerie, and she was twelve. <laughs> she wow! Was, so when we had a when we replaced her, whoa, she, she graduated and went to not in real Billy. Let me explain it to you again. <laughs> Show business is a real life. It's not real life. <laughs> she was she, she didn't go to college in real life. Did Superman really fly, Frank? Is what I want to know. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yes, uh, on TV he can. In real life he can. Not real life. So okay. Tannis went to college in the show. In the show at fifty. Right. Okay. Right. Well, speaking of uh, head of the class, that's when Tony and I met for the first time. He had a a career before head of the class. Uh, he had done a number of episodes, but really uh, and a, a number of series. Uh, what was the audition process like for head of the class? Well, I originally, you know, I went in for head of the class, and I remember I was not having a great audition day. I don't know what was going on. Um, just for me, things didn't click. I think the audition might have happened amongst a lot of other auditions because my agent at the time, Mary Grady, was throwing me out for everything every day. And it was, you know, voiceovers for for cartoons. And now you're going for a commercial, and now you got a commercial callback. You're going for the – so I was always doing tons of things in a day. And I went in, I just didn't have the best – audition. And then about three weeks later, she called me back and she said, um, actually it was probably maybe a month later. And I had heard that they were already bringing actors to the network for the role of Alan. And so she called me and she said, you have a call back for head of the class. I said, no, you must be mistaken because they brought guys to the network for the character of Alan, who I auditioned for yesterday or the day before. And she said, yeah, they didn't like any of them. So you're going back. So I made the decision in that moment. I'm like, look, do you want a series or do you not? So it's, it's time to, you know, it's time to pull up the bootstraps, get serious and really nail this. And I went in and I auditioned and I remember it was, uh, um, Michael and, and Rich and Howard Mike, Hessman was in the room. Michael Elias, Rich Houston. Michael Elias, Rich Houston. And, and yeah. Howard Hessman, who is Dr. Johnny Fever on WKRP. So I went in. Of course, I see Dr. Johnny Fever sitting there and uh, was a little thrown for, for a minute. Was he awake? Uh, or was he slouching in the chair disinterested? <laughs> no, he was, he, was, uh, he was great. And I auditioned. And Rich Eustace said to me, uh, wow. He said, where have you been? And I said, well, I was here about a, three weeks ago, but I don't think anybody remembers. <laughs> and he said, really, you were here. And I said, yeah, I said, I just didn't have the best audition. And he said, well, you nailed it today. And if you, you know, and you're going to the network tomorrow. Wow. 
So he said, you just need to do what you did today. And um, so I don't even know if Frank knows this, but when, when I went to the network the following day, you know, there's only three of us in the waiting room. It was right. myself, it was Lance Sloan, and another actor by the name of uh, Matthew Perry, whether <laughs> anybody knows his name or not. Some unknown. Yeah, some unknown guy, you know. And and uh, John Tracy, well, I believe that was his name, right, Frank, right. the director? John Tracy. Pulls me aside. He goes, can I speak with you? And, you know, we're outside in the waiting room. And we all have these incredible jitters. And and he says, uh, Tony, can I speak with you for a second? And he pulls me aside. And the other actors are looking like, you know, what are they talking about? And he says, uh, if you go in and you do what you did yesterday, you got this. And he said, this is yours to lose. Well, <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. And one hand, it's great information. On the other hand, no pressure. Uh, and I just, you know, I went in and, um, I walked in the room at ABC and it was like a theater in there and, you know, three levels of executives. I think there was like 25 of them in the room. I remember I just walked in and went, Whoa, there's a lot of you in here. You know, and they all just started laughing. And I think that really just, um, really eased the tension for me. And I just, it gave me confidence and, and I nailed it. And to this day, I still memorize, I still know the monologue about the Cuban Missile Crisis that I had to do for the audition. Prove the it. thing is still embedded in my brain. <laughs> Prove it. After the Bay of Pigs invasion, Castro was convinced the United States to try again, so he allowed the Russians to put offensive missiles in Cuba in violation of Article 5, which led to the aerial photographs from the 25th, the boarding of the Maruca on the 26th, the exchange of letters between Kennedy and Khrushchev, resulting in the dismantling of the missiles on the 29th, and Kennedy's pledge not to invade Cuba. Of course, that's just a simple overview. You can read a magazine. It's in the top drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Fantastic. You nailed it again. You nailed it again. Well, you didn't expect that out of me, did you? Huh? Well, I did expect it out of you. That's why I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. That's so when you walk into doing an audition like that, now, I, I, notwithstanding the fact that you broke the ice with that, there's a lot of you in there and everybody left, and you do the actual audition, is there any feedback from these guys, from the execs, or are they unemotional? No, no they, I just remember them just saying, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. And that was it. And I pretty much, you know, I felt confident about it. And, uh, you know, after that, I went with one of the other actresses who auditioned for the role of Simone, and she and I went to uh, the Hard Rock Cafe for for lunch. And, you know, you're sitting there and you're talking about how do you think it went, and I think it went good. And then I said, well, I kind of feel like I'm right in the middle, which is where I need to be, because um, I felt like Lance Sloan was very surfery, and I know that Alan was this very preppy, all-American kind of, and I wasn't quite sure if Matthew Perry... We were different, and I just said, I think I have a really good shot of, you know, shot at it. So I went to the payphone in the Hard Rock Cafe. That's back when they had payphones. Um, went to the payphone, and I called my agent, Mary, and she's letting me go on for five minutes about how I think it went. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm just going over the whole thing with her. And she goes, well, uh, she goes, well I think you got it. She goes, you got it. And I said, why are you saying that? She goes, no, you got it. And I said, well, you know, why you don't say that? Because I don't, she goes, no, Tony, you got it. They called me 10 minutes ago. You booked the party. <laughs> <laughs> so I go back to the table and I tell Laura Jill, Laura Jill Miller played, uh, she was uh, the youngest daughter on Give Me a Break. And she had auditioned for Simone. So I go back to the table and I'm like, I got it. I got it. She's like, oh, let me, let me go call my agent. <laughs> of course. <laughs> she comes back to the table and she's like, I didn't get it. That was a very uncomfortable lunch. Yeah, I hope you picked up the tab. You got to have real thick skin. Probably obviously. not. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to have real thick skin, I guess, you know, with the, with the constant discouragements and not getting it or getting it, not getting it. How long were you, were you, how old were you when you first broke into the racket itself? I, I was uh, 18 years old. Well, I was about 16 or 17 when I decided I wanted to do it professionally, um, growing it up in Altadena, right above Pasadena, going to St. Francis High School in La Cunata, and um, I you know, made the decision that's what I wanted to do. I sent out a few pictures and resumes. Um, Mary Grady called me in. She signed me on the spot. Uh, so I started acting professionally when I was 18. Now, Mary Grady was your agent? Mary Grady was my agent, and she was agent, my agent through most of my career. 
And she just called you in on the on the, on the eight by ten glossy or the bio? Called me and I sent out four. Uh, and there were three other agencies I sent to, and they weren't necessarily, you know, I think even one was like Wilhelmina, which was a modeling agency. But I was just going by certain agencies that I had heard of. And it just so happened that I heard um, on the Mike Douglas show, Lonnie O'Grady from, um, from It Is Enough was on the Mike Douglas show. And she mentioned that her mom was one of the top agents in Hollywood for children and younger, you know, younger actors. So I looked at the list I had and I said, oh, well, I guess I'll send one into Mary Grady. And I sent in my picture and resume. And about three weeks later, um, I had turned 18 and she called my mom and said, uh, I want to meet your son. And I went in to meet her here in North Hollywood. And uh, she was like, I like you and I'm, I'm going to sign you. Yeah, it's no wonder he's cast off a picture. Look at him. He's 60 fucking years old. <laughs> He looks 40. 61. 61. 61 years old. Soon to be 62 in, in, in uh, next month. He looks 40. He became a teenage heartthrob. He was on the cover of every fucking teenage magazine. He was he was in Circus with the Stars. It was incredible. He was he was the first. He was he was the well, he was the he was the most recent heartthrob. So we can write a couple of books about his love life if we uh, if we want to get into it specifically, I guess. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, you gave me an oh my gosh. Can we have a follow up? No, 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 no. I, I'd I like know. to go down that road. I don't want to we don't even need to, we're gonna, we're gonna skip the eighties. We're gonna skip the eighties. <laughs> so uh, you got the head head of the class and how was the pilot and how did how did you uh, how did you deal with the soon to be success of the show you know i just remember that being an enormous week for me because aside from you know getting the pilot and just being so excited about it uh you know i was excited just to be making pilot and series money um and i, I remember that that week the same week that i received the, the check for the pilot was the same week that i received the biggest residual i'd ever made from karate kid and uh I was like, wow, this, this is what they're talking about. So Karate Kid came before Head of the Class. Yeah, Karate Kid happened when I was 23. And Head of the Class happened when I was 26. So how did um, you deal with the success of Karate Kid? And did Karate Kid open any doors for you uh, moving forward? Uh, great question. Well, um, you know, the success of Karate Kid was not something we were really sure was going to happen until we all went to the screening in Westwood. Uh, the five of us Cobra Kai's went with John Avildsen, the director, um, who also had directed Rocky. It was a pretty big deal. And uh, the moment the crowd jumped on their feet at the, you know, on, at the end of the movie and just cheered and went nuts, we all got chills. And John Avildsen said, boys, we have a movie. And um, that ride was incredible um i did a couple other things uh you know in between karate kid and and head of the class <laughs> chopping mall <laughs> 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 some things you know you some things you try and forget um but but that was great and i think that head of that karate kid really it really helped open up a lot of doors because, you know, it certainly does make a difference when you have something like Karate Kid on your resume and you're going in for, you know, future auditions and they see it on your resume. It's, uh, you know, it's great. So it was awesome to be able to go in auditions and they're like, oh, wow, you're one of the Cobra Kai's in Karate Kid and what a great film and um, just was awesome to have on my resume and, and it was something incredible to talk about. Did the cast get along well in Karate Kid? Ralph, Very Ralph, well. Ralph Braccio and all like brothers, you know, we're, we're, and we're still all like brothers. Um, and, uh, you know, Ralph was a little bit more removed, but he was, he was doing his thing. He certainly had a lot more writing on his shoulders. Uh, you know, he was coming out of eight is enough and he had landed this major motion picture and he had a really, you know, he had a lot of, a lot on his shoulders now we and, uh, he kind of he was kind of removed, but I don't think it was because he was trying to keep his distance uh, and try and keep that you know that that distance between us. I think he just really had a lot to do. So when he wasn't shooting, he was in his room memorizing lines and working on karate, and he was doing his own thing. Now, when John Alveson said, "Boys, we have a movie," did you guys realize how iconic it was going to be? Like, what kind of a 
impact it was going to make on society? I mean, it was like that was a monster movie. We, I don't think we did. Um, I don't think we really realized what it was going to become. And it's even now become even more iconic um, since they created the series Cobra Kai. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it was somewhat more iconic when it was first released on YouTube Red. But it was a hard place for people to find it. And then the f next thing we know, when, you know, YouTube Red pretty much dropped it and it was picked up by Netflix and, you know, everything was his history. Yep. Yeah. Our, Netflix our, just gave us this huge platform and parents and kids and everybody. It just brought so much more, you know, so much more life back to the film. And the film ha had the original Arnold's from... Uh uh, what, what the hell? Happy days. Happy days. Oh yeah. As Mr. Miyagi, Pat Pat Morita. Yeah. Pat Morita. Pat Morita. Yeah. That was a big, big jump from him for him to go from Arnold's and Happy Days. Well, let me ask both you guys a quick question because you're both in the business and obviously I'm not. But Netflix, you're talking about how it opened up such a huge thing. Netflix is that a bigger impact than than network television had in the day, or is it a bigger audience or less of an audience, or you know? I, I mean, I, I don't know, because, you know, Frank knows when, when Head of the Class was on ABC, there was really only three networks at the time. Correct. Right. ABC, CBS, and, you know, yeah, and NBC. That was, that was it. So if I'm not mistaken, I know Frank knows these numbers. He has a, a brain like a steel trap like I do. Um, I think we used to get like, a, you know, a 17 or, or 18 rating and like a 34 share. Right, Frank? Yes. And we went off the air as one of the top 25 shows in America, we went off the air because a Howard Hessman was replaced by Billy, Billy Connolly, Billy Connolly. I almost said, a, I almost said a <laughs> Billy O'Connor again, Billy Connolly. And, and they wanted to try to, they thought Billy Connolly having his own show would, would bear greater fruit than bringing in a whole new class of kids into the New York classroom. Because obviously, with our actors getting of advanced age, approaching the thirties, <laughs> some of them <laughs> approaching their forties, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of longevity in yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so, but we—that's where we went off the air. We were still top twenty-five in the country. Yeah, but that's unusual, isn't it, from the shelf something like that? Because I mean, it's a proven no, commodity. Uh, again, because we were going down. We we had gone from like top ten to top fifteen gotcha. to top twenty to top twenty five. So the end was an, an inevitable for us. What were the what were the highlights of those years for you, Tony? On head of the class, other than working with Frank Pace. Oh, I like that. Grease the pants so the cookies don't stick. Nice well, play. <laughs> nice play. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it was just the experience that we all had. Um, you know, getting together and going for. Or lunch all the time and and all the fooling around that went on you know us you know fooling around and jumping in each other's you know, jumping out at each other and scaring each other in the middle of a show you know, just the fun things but and for me certain shows that for me were really real growing points i think for me as an actor um the grease episode okay, so let's st let's stop we have a clip from grease that derek will show you to introduce the american public to Tony O'Dell in Greece. Uh, 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 you ready for it, Derek? Well, oh, wow. So here, here it comes. <laughs> We're doing a school play. That's me flying out of the sky. Beauty school dropout, no graduation day for you, oh, beauty school dropout. Miss <laughs> your midterms and fun shampoo, -woo. well, at least yeah. you could have taken yeah. time yeah. to wash <laughs> right and clean your clothes up after spending all that dough to have the doctor I think fix they your that from Liberace. <laughs> Why keep your feeble hopes alive? What are that you was, proving? That was an amazing, amazing, you got the dream, amazing, but amazing not time. If you go for your 
diploma, you could join us then on. Also, Turn in you know, your I remember amazing you know, uh, Frankie Adam was the one who played that role in the movie Grease. All right, so you can see the similarities. I was, I was such a fan of his, and um, I actually... Yeah. Nice job. Nice job. Wow, that that was amazing, Tony. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The hair was incredible in that. I mean, uh, I was jealous just looking at the spot. And the and the, I guess at that age, I probably have a ball spot older than you were when you were playing that part. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we worked with a guy uh, on head of the class, and we later worked with him for many years uh, by the name of Marty Nedboy. And Billy's sort of the reincarnation of Marty Nedboy <laughs> uh, in, in his approach. You know, he was a uh, – Marty was not a fireman, of course, like, like Billy was. But Marty was a very memorable character. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Marty? Uh, well, um, you and know, then, I met – And then we'll get back to the memorable moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm at, at head of the class. I met, I met Marty. Um, you know, he was our stage PA on – on head of the class, which is where I first got to meet him. But Marty Nedboy, you know, he went back to being a dialogue coach on Mork and Mindy. Um, and, uh, you know, he ended up having this great long career on a lot of great shows as a dialogue coach. But he was one of the funniest, funniest people I had ever met in my life to this day. He's still one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. And, uh, I talk about him with friends who have never even met him and they're in stitches all the time, just from all the stories and the, you know, that I share about, about him. And he was like a, a father and like a mentor and a best friend. And wow. in, in, even though he was a stage PA, when I had a lot of big, big shows and head of the class, he would come to the house and he would go over the scenes with me over and over and over again. I mean, this is a guy who had worked with, you know, Robin Williams and Pam Dauber. And, um, and it was just, it was just so awesome to have him. Why did as, you, you tell us, why did you tell us a Marty story? Mm. Well, okay. So, um, uh, Marty, Marty just had this real comical look, these big glasses and he, he, he just, I remember one day we're driving down the 405 freeway and um, he had, we hadn't known each other that long. And he said something that was just incredibly nice to me. And I said, you know, Marty, that is one of the nicest things that I think anybody has ever said. I said, you know, I hope in my next life, I come back just like you. I still want to look like me. <laughs> But like he and he was like, "Oh, that is the night you fuck." <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the story of the day that uh, Cicely Tyson called the head of the class stage? I do. Why'd I do. Why did um, you tell that Rob one? Okay, Robin Givens had been um, had been married to Mike Tyson during the show, and <laughs> it was now during the time that now they had broken up. And, you know, a lot of America was, was up in arms about the whole thing. And, you know, um, a lot of America was, was, was pissed at, at Robin. And, you know, they, they had their own, they formed their own opinions, whether they're true or not. That's just what the public does. And I remember that someone called the stage. At the, those days, it was very easy just to call Warner Brothers and say, I want to speak to the, you know, I want to, the head of the class stage. So Marty picks up the phone and um, this person says, uh, yes, I would, I'm calling for Miss Tyson. And Marty says, well, I'm sorry, but um, Mrs. Tyson doesn't come to the phone. And the person says, no, I don't think you understand. I'm calling for Mrs. Tyson. And Marty was like, no, I don't think you understand. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Tyson doesn't come to the phone. And the guy said, no, I'm calling for Mrs. Tyson. And Marty said, I understand what you're saying. She doesn't. And he says, no, I'm calling for Miss Cicely Tyson to speak to Miss Tyson. So uh, those kinds of things happened a lot. With and, Marty. and Marty said, oh, oh, oh. 
<laughs> I'll get her. Oh, so, uh, the show ran five years, and Tyson was third married year. Third what, year. the last two years, the third, third year? Third year. The third year. So, third year. So was, was, did he become a distraction, Mike, on the, on, the, on the set? Was he there all the time? Or? He, I mean, he was there. I don't know if he was, uh, I don't know if he was ever much of a distraction. No. He was you know, sometimes in and out. Uh-huh. And um, after a while, you just got used to saying, oh, hi, Mike, how are you? Yeah. And of Not course, intimidating at all. No, of course, when we went to Russia, he came with us. That, that became quite a spectacle there. Yeah, he There's came. A famous chapter in the yeah. book, in a book about that. I think head of the class heads to Russia. Yeah, a famous book, I think. <laughs> yeah, and I actually, you know, not only did, um, you know, when he was on set, it was yeah, it's just like you know, there's Mike, and and uh, he and I got along really well because I was really good friends with Robin. Um, Robin and I had always been friends. We'd always shared tennis together. Um, so. I was around him a lot um, on set and at the house. And then when he came to Russia, um, I got, you know, I was with him uh, quite a bit, he and Robin. And um, it was like having my own personal bodyguard in Russia. <laughs> I felt pretty secure when I was in Russia uh, to have Mike with me. So what are your other famous memories of, or favorite memories of Head of the Class besides Greece? Russia, I, I mean, Russia was obviously one of them. Russia was one of them, being one of the, one of the, uh, I, I guess, one of the first American productions to ever shoot in Russia. The first, the first. Um, that was an incredible experience. Um, How so? You know, just to ju just to go there, and and it was during the time of Perestroika. Um, you know, being in the Red Square and, you know, they immediately knew when, when the kids looked at us, they could tell by our jeans, by our tennis shoes, they, they knew we were American. You, know, you, could, you could step on a, on a bus and you could hear people on the bus literally saying, Amerikansky, Amerikansky, Amerikansky. They were like all whispering, you know, American, American. And like they're turning around and looking at you on the bus and like looking you up and down and... Um, it never failed whenever I was walking on this, you know, walking down the street, somebody would come up and uh, usually it was a male and he would want to buy, he'd say, I want to, you know, buy your jeans. And wow. he would offer, you know, they'd offer like, you know, $200 to, to buy my jeans. But we were told never to sell our jeans because a lot of times they were, you know, KGB, they were undercover and they were trying to, you know, bust us. And, uh, you know, throw us in jail. So um, even though it was Moscow, you guys were oddities. I mean, you, the Americans oh, were. Yeah, well, you, you have to remember at that time, there were no cell phones. There was no Internet. There was no, I mean, there was no even. I, I, everything was either gold and ornate and brilliant or broken. So uh, we couldn't even get a fax to Russia. You know, we couldn't make phone calls to Russia. Wow! So it was, it was really, really hard for them, and they couldn't go out of the country. There was, it was a travel restriction on them. So they, they, they only knew what the government told them. So the Iron Curtain was more than a metaphor. It was oh, the real it was, deal. It was a real deal. It was yeah, I mean, I remember. You know, I still remember. You know, um, being driven around and seeing you know lines around the block for bread, still cheese, um, vodka. It was, it, it was crazy. You know, I personally, I love all types of food, uh, but, you know, we definitely had our share of borscht and love um, ca caviar and all that, which I personally love. I brought home plenty of caviar, um, but it was, it was a, a fascinating time. And then after we had finished filming in Moscow, I went with about seven others to, at the time it was Leningrad, now it's St. Petersburg. Uh, but went to Leningrad and went to the you know Hermitage and the Petrovodits and and just it just it was an incredible experience. You were smart. I still to this day have a, a jacket, and the jacket is a jacket that was given us to us by ABC before we traveled to Russia. And that entire jacket is just filled with Russian pins that I traded with the kids. I would give them bubble gum, and they would trade me pins. 
And uh, I've, I think I've told Frank this, but I have a jacket that's literally covered with all different kinds of pins from Russia. Yeah. So after head of the class, you went on to a number of different things. And then you segued on to George Lopez show as a dialogue coach. Uh, how was George and what was that experience like? Uh, George, uh, it, it was, it was a blast. Um, I don't think I've ever gone to work and, and laughed so much. You know, he was, he was, uh, hysterical. Uh, I remember going home some days and my, my, my face just hurting just from laughing so much at work. Um, he was, he was, uh, was and is, a, huh? Was and is, was and is he's a funny guy. Um, and he worked really hard. He worked really hard on that show, uh, to, to really be being a guy who really, you know, he'd never done sitcom before and, and didn't quite understand how it, how it all happened. And man, he learned quick. He did. And he, he, you know, he ran that show. That's what Constance said too. She said he was a really quick study, a real quick he, study. He was. The guy who had no acting chops previously. He was. Let me ask you a quick he question. The, he had the crew in stitches all the time. A quick question. You talked before about Marty being a dialogue coach and you've done dialogue coaching. What's the difference, acting coach, dialogue coach, the specifics? I mean, other than the title, is it just? No, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I kind of feel like, and, and, and Frank can speak to this, I kind of feel like dialogue coach was always the title that it had. And, and at the time, it was maybe somebody who was really just more there to help the actors memorize their lines. But then a lot of these shows have younger children and they're looking for more than somebody who's just there to help them memorize lines. It's someone who can, who can teach them, you know, which way to turn when they're on camera, uh, how to put inflection, where there's transitions, you know, how to set up joke, how to, you know, timing. And those are all things that are, come more from an acting coach. Yeah, well, so, I, I think really the difference between an acting coach and a dialogue coach was the directors of a lot of shows would feel threatened if somebody said, what do they need an acting coach for? I'm here. So they came up with the term dialogue coach. So there was no, uh -huh. there was no conflict with right. the director. Exactly. Yeah. Directors didn't question it so much. They weren't, they weren't threatened That's by great. it. Because, um, because, you know, you may have heard there's a lot of egos in Hollywood. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. So that's the difference. Basically, it's just a nomenclature. It's yeah. Just so that is the difference. And I think the first job I actually did where I was actually titled as acting coach was when I had been given the opportunity to coach on uh, two of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid films. Um, and actually, Belita Moreno, incredible Belita Moreno, who played uh, George's grandmother on George Lopez. George's mother. George's mother, sorry. She, um, she had been... Uh, she had been coaching a lot of the actors who were screen testing for Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And when they said to her, well, Belita, you're coming to Vancouver to coach on the movie. She said, no, I can't. I have a family here and I can't go up to Vancouver for three months. She said, but I, I have just the guy for you. And um, I spoke to the executive producer on a Sunday and she said, when can you be here? And I said, tomorrow. Joking around, uh -huh. he said tomorrow would be great. Well, that was in Vancouver, Washington, uh, Vancouver, Vancouver British Columbia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and uh, next thing I know is I was on a plane the next morning, and and that was the first time I had actually had the title of acting coach. And then um, and then the rest is you know is history. They were looking for someone at Disney Channel to coach on a show, shake it up, and um, uh, Frank had. Um, had introduced me to Disney Channel, and that's how my relationship with them began. And there you coach Zendaya and Bella Thorne. That's so, right. So, and and you've maintained a relationship with Zendaya and her mom, Claire, through all the years. Yeah. Uh, and you've probably still been involved in coaching Zendaya somewhat. Uh, the last few years have tapered off, of course. The, yeah, I mean, she's off busy and doing and, and doing her thing, and I'm so incredibly... Well, um, I, I would think their her. success, their success is a testament to how good a dive coach you must be. That's some pretty, pretty talented uh, material that you've turned out there. Yeah. The you know, I'll, also, I will say I had, uh, I had something really special to work with because um, 
Zendaya is a very smart woman and she knows exactly what she's doing and or she has incredible instincts, incredible intuition, aside from the fact that she's stunning. Um, uh, she brought she brought a lot to the table. So it, she's always been someone who was great to great to work with, always had her own ideas and definitely was more involved when she was, you know, first auditioning for like, you know, for Spider-Man. I coached her for the screen test for Spider-Man for. Uh, Greatest Showman, um, for her, uh, her audition for Dune, which just came out. Um, and, uh, you know, since then now, she she's kind of on her own, and she's kind of, you know, she's got her wings. She's off and flying, so I'm so proud of her. Yeah, we all are. We all yeah. are. And now you're current working on a show called Meet the Mayhems for Disney Channel? Tell us, tell that is us, correct. Tell us about that. Is, is that based on a State Farm commercial at all? <laughs> Mr. Mayhem? Oh, it's not okay. <laughs> it's not. Um, it, it's gone through, I think, a few a few titles, and this is where they have they have landed. But it's really if it's a hysterical sitcom about a family of super villains who are just trying to blend into you know normal neighborhood. Super villains? And, how? Uh, super villains in terms of the fact that they all have superpowers, okay. but, they're su- but they're super villains. Okay. Uh, they're not superheroes, they're villains. So they kind of have a very wry kind of, uh, you know, just a very wry kind of sarcastic outlook on things. And they're, you know, they're all dark in their own way. And they have these superpowers, you know, and it's almost like having the, the Adams family or the Munsters living next door. It's just nobody really knows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> until their powers kind of get out of hand. That's pretty funny. Interesting concept. Pretty funny. And it's really funny in the way they, they handle that, you know, because supervillains are technically dark, you right. know, but it's just the way they bring the comedy to it. Um, and the writing and the acting is so skilled. And it's just so fun and, and new and fresh. And I'm really excited to be a part of it. And when's it going to premiere? Probably if it's on Disney Channel, it's probably in the year 2024. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> what, it's, it's, uh, summer of, it's summer of 2022. Okay, great. So you've done the pilot already. The pilot's already been done. So the the, the pilot's uh, been done. Uh, we're we're two episodes in. Um, That's great. And uh, and then the other show that I also coach on, uh, which is now going into our second season, is called The Secrets of Sulphur Springs, which I shoot in New Orleans, and that is uh, the second season is airing. Um, in January. That's Billy's favorite town, New it's Orleans. My second favorite town outside of the, where we're hanging out in New York. But yeah, it's New Orleans, without a doubt, great and, town. Yeah, and, and you just escaped the flood. This uh, I, I just escaped the, the hurricane and the flood, and literally was there finishing the second season, and flew back in the middle of August, and it was literally I think five days before that hurricane hit, and I've already been there for some for some. Uh, heavy rains they weren't hurricanes but the downpour um cars stuck on the bridge because the the, the the cars down at the bottom of the bridge were in three feet of water yeah. and um you know i've experienced it and and can't imagine what what those people went through during katrina because uh, what, what i saw was just an iota of of what they went through um so that part of it uh you know is 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 not so fun but what a great city you know you uh hemmed your way through before when you're talking about the uh chopping mall and you went um uh, chopping mall uh but i i noticed like i'm an old movie buff and you had the the movie you made evils of the night right the sci-fi horror movie uh but i look at the cast and uh i'm looking at the cast john carradine aldo ray neville brand uh tina louise julie newmar i'm an old movie buff and uh, I don't know if you knew it, Frank, but Neville Brand, you know. I know Neville Brand. Of he was a war hero. He was a war hero, exactly. He was one of the second most decorated men in World War II. A lot of people don't realize that, that Neville Brand had made like nine Pacific landings. The know, odds of living through nine Pacific landings is astronomical. Well, and, and I myself did not even, I, I didn't know that. I mean, I remember going to set and there were just two people that I really, of course, really knew who I wanted to meet. Tina Louise. Well, <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Tina Louise 
and John Carradine. John Carradine. I mean, why not? I mean, Carradine. John Carradine, I think at the time when I met him, I don't know what he was. He must have been 90, 91 uh, doing the film. Um, I just really wanted to meet him. I remember going to his room and introducing myself um, in his trailer. And um, I actually died in that movie being lasered by Tina Louise's laser ring. <laughs> <laughs> and you played a character, Billy. Is that right? You were Billy. Sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> sure. I, I, you're still uh, dining out off that, I understand, because yeah, a lot of, you make a lot of appearances at, at card shows, signing autographs as Tony O'Dell and Chop Shop and Laser Boy and everything else. It, it, it's, really, it's really crazy. You know, there's this whole Comic-Con world out there, and um, it's just opened up a, a, whole other, a whole other thing for me to do on weekends. Um, <laughs> but you know, you know, it's not just chopping mall and chopping mall. It's funny because I look at it and I'm like, OK, that was that was the one B horror film, actually, too, because Evils of the Night. Um, but Evils of the Night was more like C. Uh, chopping <laughs> mall was more like B horror film. You know, it's classic. There's so many things about it that are just so 80s classic. And there's such a cult following for chopping mall that is unbelievable that they are still there now you know it's been thrown around as to whether or not they uh possibly might want to do a 10 episode series because kelly maroney and i who both star in the film were the only ones that really lived and so they've kind of thrown around maybe there'd be a fun way to bring back 10 episodes of of chopping mall you know 35 years later i mean they've done it with Karate Kid, and they've done it with Head of the Class. So I, I reboot every anything else I've done. Um, but <laughs> but uh, there's such a cult following for Chopping Mall. But these Comic Cons, you know, I signed for Chopping Mall. I signed for Karate Kid. I signed for Head of the Class for Cobra Kai. It's just unbelievable to meet the people who, you know, who come out, who want to meet you, who have supported you for so long. And some of them are, you know, some of them scary. You know, <laughs> scary. <laughs> you know they scary. quote lines. They quote yeah. your lines from wow. uh, doing from a line you had in Dynasty in 1980. Um, you know, and there's a few who sometimes take you for, you know, they, they think you actually are the person, or you know, they'll say, you know, how come when you were Jimmy, you know, well, how come Jimmy didn't do this, or how come you didn't do that, or I'm like, well, you know. There's a difference between me and the character, um, but it's it's amazing to meet all the people that come out. If you have um, any, a lot, of, a lot of weekends are fun. If you have any appearances upcoming, you can promote it here in the, in 2000. What year is this? 22. 20, 22. Yes. 22. Yeah, it's unbelievable. 22. I know that there are some that are lining up in 2022. I don't know of them yet. There's a lot more I'm going to be doing. Um, back east and uh i think i'm going to be doing a lot in the uk this coming year that's, that's terrific be, yeah uh, are, you, are you still friends with martina navratilova i haven't seen martina navratilova in in years um i think i i remember i saw her in wimbledon at wimbledon like maybe uh 20 years ago um and she's like hey you know yeah i haven't seen her for so long but uh but um, how did you well, meet her? How did you meet her? And how did that, I, I met that Martina come about? Because uh, Robin Givens said to me one night after we were on the show, you know, working it on the show, she said, "Hey, do you want to go down to the forum?" My friend Lori McNeil, who was a yes. professional tennis player, is uh, is doing an exhibition with Martina Navratilova, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" I mean, Martina Navratilova is like she's legendary. Um, so I went and we were backstage after their exhibition. And I remember, you know, standing there and then I was introduced to Martina and Martina said, Oh, I know you. She said, uh, you're on that, you're on that sci-fi series, other world. And at the time I'd had a sci-fi series on, on CBS that was called other world it went eight episodes. And, um, and she was like, oh, you, you play that, the kid on, on that series, Other World. And I was like, wow, wow, you know. And she's like, yeah, she's like, yeah I really like sci-fi. She goes, I really like watching you on the show. So <laughs> I was completely blown away. 
And then that night she ended up giving me her shoes, you know, that had Martina written across her shoes. And then from that moment on, um, you know, we, we became friends and, and were invited out to dinner. I was invited to um, stay with her at her home in Fort Worth, Texas, and went out to Aspen and went skiing with her in Aspen. Uh, she did that like literally a week after she had orthoscopic surgery in her knee. I mean, she was just this incredible athlete. Yeah, she's an um, incredible athlete and an incredible uh, leader of sorts. You know, incredible woman. Yeah, yes. she really, she really is. She's a pioneer in in so many ways, and I have just have so much respect for Martina. Well, I mean, she's certainly uh, again iconic. You know, Marina Martina. But uh, I got to ask you about another iconic character. You had uh, with the Liz Taylor's Oscar party. You got to tell me about that, Elizabeth Taylor's Oscar party. Yes, that's got to be a hell of a kick for a young guy. Yeah, I think that there are two uh, kind of uh, jaw-dropping moments in my life where I really had to hold it together. One was meeting Lucille Ball in 1979. Um, She was doing uh, the show uh, Bob Hope and His Leading Ladies and a variety show. And uh, I was backstage with a friend and walking right past her room. And here she comes right out the door. and we walked the halls with her and she was walking to her limousine. And, and so I got to meet Lucille Ball. And the other one, of course, was Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, a friend of mine, Kenny, was um, one of her best friends. And uh, I had already had plans to have an Oscar party at my house for my neighbors. You know, I was getting up, the, the, you know, the Oscar voting list and the whole thing you do when you have people coming over. And, and I get this phone call. Uh, from my buddy and he says um hey what are you doing tonight and I said well I'm having some neighbors over you know for the Oscar party and he said okay never mind and I said well why and he goes well because I was going to invite you over to uh Liz's and I said Liz's (laughs) (laughs) Elizabeth and he said yeah Elizabeth and I said no 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 I'm canceling my plans I'm going to Elizabeth Taylor's house with you. And what, year, like, was okay, this, what, what year was this, Tony? About just with I would I, I, I know specifically because Julia Roberts had just done Aaron Brockovich. Okay. Because Elizabeth had asked me something about what she saw when we were watching, and, and, and Julia Roberts came out, and I remember specifically talking to her about Aaron Brockovich at the time. Um, but, you know, he just said, okay, well, you know, here's your address and show up. And it was probably a, you know, a party of about, I'd say, 15, 20 people. Um, but I remember just getting there and knocking on the door and someone letting me in. And, and you know, she was milling about and talking to a few people that she knew. But um, I think at one point, Kenny had said hi to her. but. It was kind of in passing, and, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to all be damned if I'm going to come to Elizabeth Taylor's house and, and not meet her, not say hello to her. At that point, were you pretty sure she had not seen Chopping Mall? No, she, I, I wanted to make sure she had seen it. <laughs> <laughs> it's exact, that's the first thing I brought up with her. <laughs> uh, um, I just, I just remember one time she had turned away from Tyler. It was like Frank Langella, um, who was there and, and she was kind of like, just kind of standing there on her own for a second. And I walked right up to her and I said, hello, Miss Taylor. Um, I'm Kenny's friend, Tony O'Dell. And she just turned around to me and she said, well, hello, Kenny's friend, Tony O'Dell. It's so nice to meet you. And, um, and so that was, you know, kind of like that moment. And then I sat down, there was some chairs in, in, in the family room, and then there were like about six chairs in the living room. And I just decided to, you know, sit down to watch the Oscars. And she literally came and she just sat right by me. That was the chair she was sitting in. And um, just started making small talk with her. And talking with her, I said something about, I don't know, maybe I think her stockings had embroidered bumblebees on them or whatever. And she got a kick out of that. And I'm looking down, I'm literally looking down at the entire time at that giant diamond ring she had on her finger from, wow. from Richard Burton. Burton. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking at this, this ring and I'm thinking, Mal, that, I mean, 
that ring right there is worth like $20 million. Uh, um, it was just, you know, we sat there and talked about the Oscars. And then at one point, her assistant said, uh, said, hey, can I show Tony your office? Because um, Kenny had mentioned to her assistant, Tim, at the time that, um, you know, could we show Tony her office? And I just remember walking into her office. And there were two desks at the very end of the office. One was hers. One was Tim's. But the walls were lined with just photos that, that I had seen on, in the cover of Life, the cover of Time. Uh, photos with every movie star you could have imagined from the time she was nine years old to current. James uh, Dean, Montgomery Cliff, all of them. Hudson, I don't care who it is. Yeah. yeah, the biggest, you know, her and Streisand, her and Michael Jackson. Yeah. Uh, then every diplomat, every president from the time that she's nine years old. And I just looking at her walls and just thinking, what a life this woman has lived. Yeah. And are her yeah, eyes really nice, violent? Are they violent? Did they stand out? The eyes, the violent eyes? Are they, yeah. That's on the level, huh? Yeah, I just, it was an incredible night. I just, first thing I had to do when, uh, when I got home was to call my mom and talk to her about it because uh, my mom, she was just such a fan of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor. And when I told her I was going, you know, she flipped out. That's why when I was at the house and no one had introduced me to her, I thought there was no way I am calling my mother and saying, well, I was at her house, but I didn't meet her. Like uh, Frank's encounter with John Wayne and his father's envy of him meeting John Wayne as he writes about in the book. Yeah. Uh, hell of a yeah. difference to the yeah. real person. Tony, I know you keep in touch with the kids from head of the class, kids now, yeah. as you approach 60s. Uh, why don't you tell us about who's doing what and who you're still in touch with? I'm pretty much still in touch with uh, with all of them. Um, I haven't talked to Brian Robbins in a while, but Brian is busy uh, being president of Paramount, <laughs> so he's he's doing okay for himself. Yeah, yeah. he's doing okay. And uh, of course, Dan Schneider, who I talked to quite a bit, he's you know created so many iconic shows uh, for Nickelodeon, iCarly, Victorious. I mean, there's so many. Um, there's so many. Uh, sh incredible shows that he's created for Nickelodeon. I talked to, uh, you know, Dan Frischman, Christine Hodge, Kimberly Russell. Uh, she and I talk literally, I think Kimberly and I talk um, weekly still to this day. Um, we've always had a special relationship. Robin Givens and I, Robin and I talk a lot, but you know, Robin, I'm, I'm so proud of her because aside from all of the acting, she's just acting in so many different shows. Um, you know, she's directing now and uh, she's really taking off as a, as a director and I'm really happy for her. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of in touch with, with all of them. And, you know, I think that's the incredible thing about, you know, when, when you work on all of these shows, you, you become like family. You all share something so, you know, when you experience a success like that, you all experience it together and it just, it brings you together, and I think you're just family for life. You know, that, that, that's that's how it is with me, with the guys from Karate Kid, with with the cast of head of the class. I mean, you all kind of just are like family forever. Yeah, like, like Tony and I are still good friends. Thirty five years later, Barry Halley and I and Tony are good friends. You know, we're Bridget Osher Shelter, who was one of the uh, costumers on it, is uh, was a, a friend of ours, Steve Papazian. We all get to dinner, you know, once or twice or three times a year just to reminisce and tell old stories and make up a few lies. And uh, we just have a great time. Well, you talk yeah. about that Murphy Brown and uh, suddenly Susan. When you're yeah. there long enough, it's family. I mean, uh, you know, even even Sandy Bullock, uh, when they were making that Ocean's 12 or Ocean 7 or whatever the name what, what it was, I was invited to the premiere in New York City. And in Gazina and Sandy Bullock, uh, treated me like a long lost son uh, or, or or an old friend uh it's it's, it's incredible uh, how she she was an incredible um sandy uh, people ask me but she's yeah i think sandy bullock is she's just an incredible woman i think she's incredibly smart um i used to love when she would you know come down to 
uh, you know, every what every every shoot night that we had, Sandra Bullock would would come to set, and um, and then I kind of became more friends with her because if I was at George's house and spending time with George and Ann, um, you know, Sandy was there, and I remember she was doing a movie with Regina King, and and we were talking, and she said, "Hey, do you want to come down to the set tomorrow and visit?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure." And literally just went down the next day and, and watched her film. Um, she is just the most, you know, down to earth, just in incredible woman, yeah. smart. Uh, um, she's just awesome. Yeah, she's got it. Well, you're talking about that camaraderie. Now, like what head of the class or suddenly Susan or Murphy Brown, you're talking about what? Eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Is it five days, days a week? Five days a week is it? Five 10, days a week. Ten, yeah. twelve hours. It, well, you know, for, I think things have changed. I mean, from when things have when changed. We, yeah, they have changed. When I did head of the class, you know, you have your rehearsal days, and you know, you come in at eight or nine or whatever. You have your rehearsals and you have your producers or network run throughs around two o'clock, three o'clock. Uh, you go home. So a lot of those days, you know, the the rehearsal table read and rehearsal days are are like six hour days, and they still are. Um, for me, even our table read days now is we, we table read on Zoom, we go to the studio, we have lunch, and then we rehearse for two or three hours. See, and Tony, we go home. you got a short memory. You got a short memory because those were not the Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays that I remember from head of the class. I remember being in at eight or nine o'clock, but I also remember breaking for lunch. And you guys, we would go to. Uh, that Italian restaurant or something, and we'd spend an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes before you got back to lunch, and and we'd break from lunch from like twelve. We wouldn't start rehearsing till quarter or one, and then we would rehearse till about four o'clock. And if the director felt he had it, he would call the office and said, "Let's, we're ready for the run through." So it would be four o'clock. But if he if he didn't feel he was ready for the run through, then he would call. Well, I need a half another half an hour. So a lot of times the writers didn't get in the rewrite room until five, six o'clock at night. Did we have run throughs on table read days? No. Mondays, okay. Mondays, yeah. Mondays with no run through, but the first run through would be Tuesday and the second run through would be Wednesday. And then we'd block and shoot on Thursday. We'd block and shoot big scenes on Thursday and then we'd do the rest of the show in a live audience on Friday. Yeah. Now, now for shoot days, we wouldn't come in until 11 o'clock or maybe 10 o'clock because we would only shoot half the show. Yes. We yes. would shoot half the show on Thursday, then shoot the other half of the show on Friday. Yes. And the reason I, and I changed that. I, I think I was the first one to change it because on suddenly Susan, because we were doing the shows at seven or seven thirty. And we're just sitting around the audience. I'd be mean, sitting around the office or whatever. And of course, the actors would come in at noon. Right. Or no, actors would come at noon, 11 30, 11 o'clock, and not do the show until seven. I said, What the hell are we doing here? Uh, and with the audience services company always said, Well, we can't get an audience before, before seven o'clock on a Sunday, on a Friday night. I, and when we do when we did suddenly Susan, I said bullshit. We've got Brooke Shields. We're going to get a. Sh we're gonna, be a we'll, we'll be we'll get an audience anytime we do a show, even if we do a show at noon. So we started, yeah. we started coming in at nine o'clock in the morning, keeping the same schedule, and then we were out. Suddenly, by by starting a show at five o'clock, we would be out by eight thirty nine, right. and that made all yeah. the difference in the world because being out by eight thirty nine is a big difference than being out by eleven thirty twelve. Uh, so. Yeah, and, and, and it's a little different now because, you know, on on shoot days, um, like for the show that I'm on, our table read is, is Wednesday. We rehearse Thursday, Friday, have our run throughs on Thursday, Friday, and we shoot Monday, Tuesday. Right. Now, with we don't do audience. Obviously, we don't have an audience because our right. shows, number one, are complicated. There's a lot of special effects, so you don't have the time. But number two, you can't have an audience because of COVID. Yeah. So. All we do is we come in on shoot days, Monday morning, come in at 8 o'clock, and that's a 12-hour day, and Tuesday is a 12-hour day. Yeah, it's a 12-hour day because of your director. If Joel Zwick was directing, we'd be out nine and a half. 
<laughs> because Joe was the greatest camera blocker I've ever seen. Well, let me ask you a quick question. You said before block and shoot. What is the block part of that? I mean, I get to shoot. What is the, the block? Just part? basically meaning the actors or the stand-ins come in. They show the camera men. They show the cameras the scene, so the camera guys can learn the blocking. Because the camera's got to be. They all have each scene. They have different assignments. So the two wide cameras got close-ups. The middle cameras got a two shot and a, and a, and a master. So, yeah. and, and then they trade off depending on where the action takes them. Yeah. So those guys have to learn where the actors are moving, what their blocking is. Oh, I so see. once they learn it, then the actors come in, the stand-ins give their notes if they've made any changes and then the camera, then we shoot that. Right. Then the next scene, they block it with the stand-ins gotcha. and then shoot it. Yeah. Now I understand. The first, the first oh. pass, they show it to the actors with the actors in the scene. They show it to the cameraman with the actors in the scene. Then the stand-ins step in, the, the, the cast goes into makeup, touch-ups, hair, et cetera. Yeah. That's when Tony, as a dialogue coach, does a lot of his work because during that time, he's rehearsing with the cast. And it's exa he's exactly right. And, you know, at first – I thought it was going to be a challenge because with COVID, uh, they only want so many people in hair and makeup. And um, I kind of feel like, you know, the relationship that a lot of actors have with their hair and makeup people is very special. It's a time for them to talk and they fool around and they visit and this and that. You know, when I come walking in, it's like, oh, great. We can't do that because Tony's here. Um, but they've now realized I have a job to do. And the only time that these actors really get a chance to go over their scenes and a lot of times, as Frank knows, those scenes have changed a lot overnight. Um, so that's the only time I really have with them is in hair and makeup. So it's nice now that, the, first of all, uh, they're letting me into hair and makeup. Um, you okay. know, I still have to wear my mask or whatever. If I get close and the actors has their mask down, I have to wear my goggles to, to protect myself. Um, but they allow me in there because that's when they're getting hair and makeup. And then they're going over their lines with me and we're talking about beats. And then if the actor goes to their room and I have more time and we have more, I have more specific notes that I want to give in private, then I do that. But um, that's the time that I really get to do my work. Wrapping up, uh, Derek, I know you had a question you wanted to ask Tony about residuals, how they work. Yeah, that's the question. So uh, residuals for actors. Can you give, can you give a layman? layman's uh, a definition of what it looks like and something that would be even better uh, for the, the audience is give an idea of what and this is kind of a weird question but like what the difference the check looks like in the beginning versus let's say after like 10 years residuals check yeah yes okay well um the residuals are residuals are an actor's dream uh <laughs> we love we love residuals um, you know, it used to be that residuals, how they would come is, you know, your, your, your show or your film airs, um, and, uh, you know, you've already been paid to do the initial show itself or the initial episode or the initial film, but then when it, as it re-airs, um, or the, you know, the movie continues and the movie sells and goes to video or DVD or whatever it does then you get paid for those uh, either uh, the, the things being sold or from those episodes rerunning. And, you know, when they first start out, they start out a lot of times at 100%. Uh, so if you're good to do an episodic and maybe you're going to do a guest starring role and you got paid $3,000 or $4,000 to do the guest star role, when that reruns the, the next time, you're going to get 100%. You're going to get that same check again. Then over time, uh, you know, your, your, your check's going to slowly go down if that episode keeps rerunning or as those, that film continues to play throughout the year, whether it's on TV or it continues to sell, those checks get less and less. I mean, I now get residual checks for a murder she wrote for 13 cents, wow. you know. Um, you know, once in a while, I'll get one for Airwolf, $27. Uh, I've even had a residual check that was for zero cents. Um, <laughs> but they had to show that it re-ran and that they were acknowledging the fact that the episode re-ran. 
But literally was for a penny. Yeah. And, Taxes came in and took that. And, wow. and, and, that, and that's the way our society works. They spent 51 cents to send a stamp to have a zero cent residual. He's right. I called the company and I was like, wait, this has to be a mistake. I said, because you spent more on the stamp than you did yes. the check was worth. And she said, well, sir, we still have to send it to you. But, um, but you know, so, you know, uh, a good example, Karate Kid. Karate Kid started out just incredible um, uh, when, when video sales happened for Karate Kid and it sold in VHS. Uh, I remember at the time, Beverly Hills Cop was the number one selling uh, VHS. And then Karate Kid took its spot. Whoa. And I remember hearing the buzz, oh, we're going to get incredible. It's going to be an incredible residual check, an incredible residual check. And the first one, I think I remember, was like, I don't know, six, dollars $7,000. And I was like, hey, this isn't so bad. But then every quarter on films, like whether it's, you know, uh, you know, Karate Kid, Cobra Kai, whatever, it's paid quarterly. So every three months. So three months later, I'm hearing, okay, well, now they had to really leak the bulk of the money out to the actors. They were able to hold on to it for so long. And I was doing the pilot of Head of the Class, and Rob Garrison, um, one of my Cobra Kai brothers who is, is now passed away, uh, he, he called me up and he said, you need to sit down. Whoa. And I said, well, he said, you need to sit down. And I'm like, he said, it's better than the first. And I remember he said, our next check, I was just down at SAG, and our next check is $24,000. And I just, I flipped out. I was doing the pilot of the head of the class, and, you know, and it was just, that was, you I was blown bit? away. Yeah, but a quick question now, would Ralph Macchio get more than that? Would, would it be? He would, because I think he had like a point or two of the film. Uh-huh. Oh, ah, yeah. the point. So yeah, if this, yeah, if this guy, and we're not talking about off of net proceeds, <laughs> hopefully he had a good attorney that was going off the gross. It wasn't after the studio got, well, first we get to deduct the marketing and, de- you know, they could have all their write-offs. Right, right, right. He was, it was off the, you know, off the gross. So, that's what a lot of actors are doing is they go in, if they're big stars of the film, they're going in and getting, you know, a point, two points of the gross. The well, back end. Yeah. It's all about this back yeah. end that I hear so much yeah, about. That's about. The back end deal. And so, but hey, um, I didn't mind getting those residuals. Then over time, they went down and they went down. But then Cobra Kai came along. And then that just then kind of was, a, there was a, this resurgence of Karate Kid again, and them they're playing Karate Kid a lot more, and um, and then Cobra Kai, and then I did an episode of Cobra Kai, uh, you know. So now it's it's just kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Residuals are the, the gift that keeps on giving. Karate Kid is the gift that keeps on giving, and I say if only I had done like twenty films. Like that? Like, wow. like Karate Kid. I mean, I look at actors like Tom Hanks and Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise. I mean, you know, and these guys all had points of, right. of the, the back-end deal. By the way, Tony O'Dell knew Brad Pitt before he was Brad Pitt because Brad Pitt did an episode of Head of the Class. A, he did. A, a, prob- and, and, a problem with Maria. Yep, yeah, and we became uh, buddies during, during that film. And uh, the last time I actually saw Brad Pitt um, – he and Robin Givens and I went to Dar Maghreb, which is a Moroccan restaurant on Sunset Boulevard. It's no longer there. And, uh, and I took them to dinner. I paid for that dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that was one dinner, Frank, I paid for. <laughs> I must have known something. Yeah, they must have. And it kind of like disappeared. And I, was, I remember sitting there. I was thinking, I wonder what happened to Brad. I haven't talked to him in a while, and his number has changed. And I'm sitting in a movie theater. And I'm sitting in the movie theater, and it was this, uh, this Selma film, Louise. Selma Louise, and I thought, <laughs> you son, son of a of bitch. bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's great. That's you got great. your shirt off, and you're, you know, you're in bed with Gina Davis, and what the hell's going on here? And, and that and was, that was the beginning. Yeah. That was the beginning of Brad Pitt's career, and, uh, you and wanna, wow. Yeah. You want to spill, spill some tea on uh, Brad Pitt? Any uh, any stories nobody's ever heard before? Say no. Um, <laughs> I just remember this guy come walking on to set. And you know, those were the days of grunge. 
Yeah. Where, you know, the grunge, the Johnny Depp look, the, that look was just so popular. And, you know, we're all sitting there, you know, getting ready to do our, you know, our table read for head of the class. And, you know, and uh, we're waiting for this guy to show up. He probably was a little late. And I remember he turns the corner and here comes, you know, this guy and he's got this blonde stringy hair hanging in front of his eyes and comes in with his white t-shirt and, you know, kind of tucked into his jeans with holes in them with his black army boots, just kind of like shuffling his feet, come to set. And I just remember Robin and Leslie and Christine and everybody just turning and looking to the side and they're like, who the hell is that? I remember one person who shall remain nameless. Uh, she said, I would have dropped my pants right there <laughs> when he walked in. He just, yeah, he walked on the set and it was like, <laughs> you know, and all of us guys are, you know, we're all like, oh, come on. Uh, you know, well, um, he just, he, he, he walked on the set. He, the, the, the guy had it. He just had it. Yeah. Take, um, bef again, before you go, why don't you tell us the, co the story about how your car was r ransacked? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, Frank always remembers the best stories. <laughs> <laughs> I was living in my apartment in, in, on, on Chandler Boulevard in North Hollywood before I bought this house, which, of course, is, is the house that head of the class built. Um, and, uh, you know, as an actor, you always keep your pictures and resumes in your car, you know, you, you never know. You're going to go on an audition. You always bring your picture and resume with you. And at the time I had a Mazda RX-7, which, by the way, I happened to buy with the money I made in the pyramid schemes. Remember the pyramid schemes? Oh, yep. In 1980. And the pyramid games had had, oh, hold on. I think someone's at the door. They're coming to get me. Uh, <laughs> the pyramid games, and you know, in, in nine nights made like 16000 and. And I had bought this Mazda RX-7, and I had my pictures in the car. And I remember I woke up in the morning, and my friend, uh, my roommate at the time, her name was Robin, a uh, different Robin, and she said, uh, hey, I didn't think you were home because your, your car's not there. And I'm like, what? And she said, yeah. And she said, I heard glass break in the middle of the night. Your, your car's been stolen. So, of course, I look out, my car's been stolen, and I think they found my car, and they returned my car back to me. Uh, I think that the only thing that they had taken, are, well, they pretty much, they stripped, everything. they took the tires, uh, they took the seats, they took everything. But they left my headshots. <laughs> <laughs> the final indignity. The final indignity. <laughs> they didn't want my headshots. I mean, yeah, well, that was. Well, you uh, were Italian Catholic growing up, so that's like the final indignity. It's like not getting raped by a parish priest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't watch it. <laughs> Billy, any any final questions for Tony? One quick question. Uh, when you said you were eighteen and the way you started. Uh, and you got picked up by an agent. It sounds like something out of a Hollywood script itself. What was the impetus for that? Were your parents behind you? Were they the driving influence or was it all you? It, it was all me. I mean, I remember telling my mom at 16, you know, I was going to St. Francis. I said, you know, mom, I, I think I want to be an actor. It's something I've been doing for fun all my life. I've been doing plays in, in school. And I, I think that's what I want to do. I want to be a professional. And she said, no, you know, you don't know anybody. We don't know anybody in the business you don't know what to do. Uh, you, you know, you don't have an agent. I said, well, you know, I'm going to this theater in, in Pasadena. I'm doing plays at the Jester's uh, Theatrical Playhouse in Pasadena. And there's one of the dads. He has a list of agents or whatever. And she said, you know, you, you want to you try? You want to do it? Do it. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to put myself through a, a summer session at the American Academy at the time it was in Pasadena. And um, she said, fine, you want to do it, go do it. So I went and did the, the summer session, American Academy. And, um, and I got the list of agents. And then, uh, like I said, I've been watching the Mike Douglas show. 
and I looked up Mary Grady's name, um, and it all just kind of happened. My father, you know, he, he was kind of removed. My father was a produce man. He was working 12 hours a day delivering produce to all of the top restaurants in L.A. Uh, so um, my father, I'd see him in the morning. I wouldn't see him till late at night. But, um, you know, Mary signed me. And the rest is history. Slowly they started seeing my career unfold, you know. Um, I started doing guest starring roles in shows that they were aware of. I'm like, hey, mom, I got a, a guest starring role in Eight is Enough or a guest starring role in Dynasty. And, and um, then, they, then they were on board. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they were, they were thrilled for me. But it was something I pretty much did on my own. Yeah. That's, so, that's much, so much of us did. So Tony's uh, also a, a, a very decorated voice actor. Can you, uh, we would use Tony in a role uh, that he will repeat now. Can you cry like a baby? <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, it's been a while. I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I'll never forget they were trying to, they, they, they we were doing a series called For Your Love with Holly Robinson and James Lejeur. And I was hired as the dialogue coach. It was actually the first show I had done as a, as a coach. And I remember Shelly Jensen saying, well, we're going to need to hire a, a, a baby or a baby crier because in the episodes, the Holly Robinson's character was going to have a baby. And I remember going home and thinking, well, they're going to go and hire some voice actor to do this. So I started playing around with it, and I, I'm, I'm friends with Bob Bergen, who plays, who's the, who is yeah. Porky Pig. Bob's been, a, Porky Pig. Bob's been a guest. Yes. So I remember what Bob would say in terms of how to try and form a voice. And I came home, and I'm like, going, <laughs> making all these noises. And I go to the set the next day, and, we're, and I'm doing it in the corner. And Shelly Jensen goes, who the hell is that? And they go, it's Odell. He goes, you're doing that for run through. So run through came about and they said, they do the, you know, it was my time. I was on and I go. Perfect. You did it. And I remember the whole, like all the producers, everybody in the front row and they all turn and they look in their eyes. They couldn't believe it. And I, I, uh, any vets that hire him. Yvette said, yeah, he's doing it. Yep. Versatility. And, yeah, versatility. Be able to and do it. From that moment on, in fact, in For Your Love, I actually also became the audience switcher who was the guy editing live for the audience that come in and watching on the, on the TV screens. So I was dialogue coaching. I was, I was camera. I was switching for the monitors. And then I would run down below if there was a, a baby cry in one of the scenes. I would run downstage and do baby crying. You got to you got to make it where you can. <laughs> Pay the rent. <laughs> Pay the rent. <laughs> but I have done I've used that baby cry quite a few times in uh in a lot of episodes. Wow. Too that, much. That's so great. Well, you've been a terrific guest, Tony. Can't thank you enough. I hope you have a terrific 2022 and uh we'll have Thank you guys. I, I really I love future. I love your your you guys your guys show. It's uh you guys are great and you guys are so much fun and uh it's just, it was really a pleasure. It's really a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. It's a real pleasure. Thank to you, pal. You, brother. Really. I enjoyed it. Talk to you soon. Great talk. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, Tony. Bye. Yeah, great guy. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, terrific. And, uh, and you know, again, about paying the rent, you know, like he does a baby cry and he does voice, uh, voice coaching, animated voice, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Yeah, you have to do that in order to survive. You because pay you, the bills. You know, you you. you if you're very lucky, you're going to get one show that lasts five or six years. Yeah. And, you know, you may be able to make enough money to last for the rest of your life, but you probably won't. So, you you know, you've got to do what you can do to get by. And Tony's... Uh, Until the next big one comes along, you know, or again, you, know, you might get lucky again. Will lightning strike twice, you know? But Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many actors hit in a, in a series once and never, never saw, saw them again. So. Well, we talk about that, about Andy Warhol saying everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes. He was wrong. Everybody's yeah. famous for five minutes, yeah. maybe three. Yeah. 
maybe none like me and you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, n- maybe none like me and you. <laughs> I'm smart, Frank. I'm smart. I'm dumb like everybody says. Yeah. I got a question before we go. Yes, sir. The, yes, uh, sir. the, the movie where the show where he did the baby crying, were you producing it? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you pay him for that? Yes, sir. Okay. Just checking. I can cry, Frank. Uh, I, <laughs> I, actually, Tony was, uh, you know, I try to pay everybody I can. I mean, yeah. I. You know, so much, so much money is wasted above the line uh, that if, I mean, if a director wants to do it, to do it, a role in the in a a show, I say don't do that. I'll I'll go to the director and I say you can't do that, and he'll say why not? He said because you're taking the work away from an actor. Somebody other work. You're making your fucking money. You're making good money above the line. So give it to somebody who's going to make. $500 $500 yes. for crying. Right. So Tony got paid you know, two or three times. Well, you're a union guy. You believe that that's the way it should work. Everybody should get a piece of the pie. And listen, uh, doing the research for Tony, I was looking, I mean, it's no accident. He worked with you at head of the class, and then he got a part. And suddenly Susan, George Lopez, I'd shake it up. So, you know, you 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 take care of the people who are good to you. That you're friends with them. You yeah, do the right thing. I do. I, t- well, I take care of people who take care of me. Yeah, you do the right thing. Except for Derek. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of those people. Hey, hey, hey. He's not He's one <laughs> All right. See you next week, folks. All right. Yeah, see you next week. Have a great New Year, man. Have a, have the best. The best there is. I hope that nothing but health and prosperity and happiness for all of you out there. And thanks for tuning in and listening Prosperous to our 2022. Nonsense. Exactly. Next week's guest, actor, writer, producer, director in New York, Los Angeles, and Paris, Michael Elias. We'll see you next week. 